and uh, this is the first lecture of 2022 and uh, wish you all a very happy new year today is tuesday january 11 2022 and i am rifat manan joining you from california and i am remotely joined by my good friend emilio madrigal who is in boston so today we are very delighted to welcome dr vijay joshi so who is a very eminent pediatric pathologist and he is an affiliate clinical professor of pathology at the Medical College of Virginia at Richmond. And today's lecture is brought to you all in association with uh, Indian Association of Pathologists of North America, which we call IPNA in short. And the title of today's talk is Stepwise Approach to Diagnosis of Extended Ewing Family Tumor. And this would be a two part talk. So today's talk will be part one. And as always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on both YouTube and Facebook chat windows. And Dr. Joshi will answer them towards the end of the session. And thank you, Dr. Joshi, for uh, presenting this lecture to us today and to all of the viewers. And thanks to Aipna for making it uh, possible. Over to you now, Dr. Joshi. Thank you, Dr. Rifat Manan for making your podcast platform available to me for this presentation. The title of this presentation is shown on this slide, Extended Ewing Family Tumors. The emphasis is on stepwise approach to diagnosis. I wish to give thanks for providing articles, data, photos, and for sharing cases to Drs. S. Smith, L. Wong, S. Ranganathan, V. Kumar, F. Balarazo, B. Bakchi, S. Muradi, and J. Lakshmi, and to Dr. Nat Pernik and his colleagues at Pathology Outlines, and to all the authors of review and focused articles on EEFTs and of other online materials. I was working from my home office where I did not have these resources, so all these colleagues have provided those resources very kindly. I'm also thankful to IPNA for sponsoring my webinar. The plan, the plan of presentation is given on this slide. It is divided into two parts. Part A will be given today. Part B will be given in February, February 15th. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is to go over short, very briefly, history of Ewing sarcoma family, then I will say a few words about the new members or entities which make an extended family. And these new members are recognized by NGS. I will also say a few words about nomenclature. And then the main emphasis of the presentation would be on stepwise approach, which includes clinical pathologic or clinical histologic and ICC profiles and genetic markers of these tumors, uh, which are required for diagnosis of EFTs. I will also give original and recent references on the slides. And lastly, I will briefly go over biologic relevance of genetic markers. In today's presentation, we'll go up to clinical histologic profiles. In part two, we'll do the rest of the uh, talk. So it goes back to history. History goes back to 1921, more than 100 years, when Dr. Ewing described what he called as hemangioendothelium of bone. Even before that, in 1918, Dr. Arthur Purdy Stout of Columbia University had reported what he called as peripheral neuroepithelioma. These two entities, hemangioendothelioma and neuroepithelioma, were characterized by routine histology. And therefore, the emphasis of my presentation today is on routine histology. There are some typing errors here, which you, I hope you will not mind. So we have hemangioendothelioma, neuroepithelioma. Hemangioendothelioma was designated later as Ewing sarcoma neuroepithelioma as primitive neuroectodermal tumor or PNET. And another tumor was added to this list that is malignant small rind cell tumor of thoracopulmonary region by Dr. Askin in 1979. These three entities were shown to have similarity in histology, in ICC, and in genetic markers. So Dr. Corey 
coined the term Ewing sarcoma family of tumors for these three entities. The next two slides give the references. So we'll skip that. So we have ESPNET and Askin tumor. We started calling these ES slash PNET. Askin tumor was merged with PNET. The current trend is to only use the term ES and delete PNET. My own personal choice and experience is that we should retain the terminology ES with or ES without neural differentiation. The rationale behind this is that when you are thinking about ES with and or without neural differentiation, you will look for rosettes, which will serve as a clue for the working diagnosis of ES. So this is the uh, Ewing sarcoma with uh, rosettes. Now, to these three entities, new entities were added with new gene fusions recognized by NGS, and these were added to the ES family. So it became extended Ewing family tumors. This is the term I have used for this presentation. It's not an official term uh, in any published article uh, or a textbook. I have used the designation for the convenience of this presentation. So what are EEFTs? Basically, they are small round cell tumors with or without spindle cell component. Secondly, there is total absence of differentiation in these tumors. Thirdly, there is a fusion between FET ETS gene family members or between FET non ETS family members. So you have these three criteria for inclusion in the extended family. I have used the, uh, I have included the undifferentiated round cell tumors which show fusion between two genes other than the ones in C above here. And these are the B-core and sick rearranged sarcomas. These are considered as distinctive entities, but I have included them in extended, extended Ewing family tumors for this presentation. So we have these five entities. I, we need not go into the details of genetic markers at this point. We'll be coming to that in the part two of my presentation. Let's just remember at this point that there are five entities to be discussed in EEFTs based on differences in genetic markers. There is a sixth entity described here. We are not going to deal with this. This is undifferentiated sarcoma with no distinctive gene marker. Maybe in future, there will be a few cases out of this entity, which uh, will be shown to have a uh, distinctive genetic markers. But for this presentation, we are going to confine our discussion to these five entities. The diagnostic workup of these tumors is resource intensive. It requires wide range of ICC stains and of tests for molecular markers. And in some cases, difficult cases, you may have to refer the case to centers for expertise and resources. I am trying to give you, a, present to you a global perspective by bringing to you the histologic and ICC profiles of these tumors so that on the basis of working diagnosis made from these profiles, you will be able to request targeted the ICC stains and molecular genetic markers, which will tend to reduce the cost. Resources, that is a challenge in the, for the institutions in developing countries. There are limited tools. The range of ICC bodies, anti antibodies may not be very wide. There may not be methods available for molecular genetic markers. The costs of both clinical and pathology tests are prohibitive. Uh, in the developing countries, and therefore a targeted approach, as I have suggested to diagnostic workup, will reduce the cost. Uh, as you know, fine needle aspiration biopsy may be feasible, only, only a procedure feasible in certain developing countries. And you also very well know that fine needle aspiration biopsy samples can be triaged for ICC and genetic markers and a definitive diagnosis of EEFT can be made. Now, 
when we approach EFT, I will say that basically these tumors belong to the broad group of SRCTs, that is small round cell tumors in children and in adults. There are two sets in this broad group of SRCTs. The first broad group is, those, is that of established SRCTs, well established, well described, well uh, characterized SRCTs with demonstrable line of differentiation, with demonstrable line of differentiation. And there are three subsets in this established uh, group. And the second uh, group is the EEFTs, which are an emerging group, not yet established as firmly as the group A. These are undifferentiated small round cell tumors. There is an exception to this, and that is the subtype of Ewing sarcoma showing neural differentiation. So we have already started seeing that I am making general statements, but there will always be exceptions to the general statements. That's what makes pathology interesting and exciting and challenging. So there are three subsets in the established uh, SRCTs. Uh, conventional spectrum is the first one. Neuroblastoma is an example of that. Then second subgroup is the small round cell variants of certain tumors, for example, osteosarcoma. And then the third subgroup is the biphasic sarcomas with small round cell component. And mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is an example of that. Now, straight off, I'm going to say that by stepwise approach, the subsets, all the subsets of established SRCTs have been ruled out. This is the assumption for the purpose of this presentation, which I'm going to confine to EEFTs. And I'm going to assume that the case that is being sent to me today is one of EEFTs. And I have ruled out all other possibilities by, uh, by uh, appropriate studies. So the main established entities that need to be considered in the differential diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma is our neuroblastoma, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma showing dense pattern, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma showing solid pattern, and lymphoblastic non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of bone, which is CD45 negative and CD99 positive. And then you also have to consider the small round cell variant of osteosarcoma of uh, in uh, Ewing sarcoma, in the differential diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma. So let's now uh, assume, as I have already said, that all aforementioned entities in subsets of established pediatric and small round, adult small round cell tumors have been ruled out by stepwise approach, and we are left only with the five EEFTs, uh, 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 which, uh, which we need to have a differential diagnosis. So, the current trend in the diagnosis of these tumors is to do a needle biopsy and send about four to five crores. If there is a bone tumor with an extension into the soft tissues, it is suggested that the biopsy should be done from the soft tissue extension because decalcified tissue is unsuitable for NGS. The needle cores that we get are small, but they seem to be adequate as shown by the 91% rate of accuracy in a large series of needle core biopsies that is of 233 cases. Furthermore, there are certain clinical advantages to this procedure. So it is going to stay with us and we are going to continue to get needle cores rather than incisional biopsies. The triage of incisional bio or triage of needle core biopsies is routine. You all are familiar with that. The only thing that I would emphasize is that you have to take a, have a sample for next generation sequencing. Whether it is a research method or a diagnostic method, you need to have a sample. Fresh frozen tumor from one of the cores is the ideal sample. But if you cannot have that, you can send a block of FFPE tissue, or you can send 10 unstained slides with five micron sections. As I've already indicated, FNA samples are can be processed for NGS. What they advise is that the smear should have preferably 5,000 tumor cells uh, within three to 10 nanograms of DNA. If you send sections in the sections, there should be at least 20% tumor nuclei. So 
there is one difference between the type of sample for whole genome versus targeted, targeted NGS. High molecular weight DNA from fresh tissue is required for whole genome sequencing. Low molecular weight DNA from FFPE tissue is acceptable for targeted sequencing. When I, when I say FFPE tissue, I must emphasize that unrecycled buffered neutral formalin should be used for fixation of these biopsies. So let's start off with, uh, uh, with a case, a 12-year-old white American boy with a large mass of mid-shaft of femur or a soft tissue mass of chest wall. <clears throat> Size, other imaging features, the laboratory data are all suspicious for malignancy. Needle core biopsies were sent to us. Uh, the histology, a quick look at the biopsy tells us that it is the tumor is composed of small round cells and spindle cells. The assumption is that, as I have already indicated, that all established SRCTs have been ruled out and the differential diagnosis that I'm going to talk about will be only between EEFTs. So this is a low power view of the biopsy. These are evenly, these are densely packed small round cells and there are a few spindle shaped cells here, as you can see in this biopsy. I'm not going to go into any further details on this biopsy at this point. What I'm going to go through is the diagnosis stepwise approach to the diagnosis of SRCT. And in this stepwise approach, which is represented here diagrammatically, what we do is there is an emphasis on arriving at a working diagnosis based on clues from clinical features, imaging studies, lab data, routine histology, electron microscopy, which is optional. Uh, I would think that since this is an emerging group of tumors, I think in the spirit of science for the sake of science, ultrastructure of these tumors should be intensely studied, uh, even if they may not prove to be of any diagnostic value. And then we also have to look at the ICC profile and on the basis of clues obtained from these different pieces of data, we come to a working diagnosis and that working diagnosis is confirmed by a definitive diagnosis, uh, confirmed by demonstrating molecular genetic markers. And, uh, and we take, uh, uh, we take a, uh, an approach which requires uh, targeted ICC stains and targeted uh, genetic markers. So uh, what we do then in the basis of clinical histologic clues, we construct a, clini a profile, clinical histologic profile. And this gives us a working diagnosis. When we have a working diagnosis, on the basis of that working diagnosis, we can request from a wide panel a focused ICC, a focused ICC stains, which are useful for strengthening the working diagnosis. And then we can request targeted tests for genetic markers to confirm the working diagnosis. Focused and targeted tests, as I already said, will tend to re reduce the costs and the turnaround time. So these are the five entities that we are dealing with in EEFTs. And these are the genetic markers, which are given here on this slide. I will not go through the genetic markers at this point for to save time. We are going to come back to these as we go on uh, in the presentation and also in the second part of presentation. So we have Ewing sarcoma, we have these fusion sarcomas with FET non-ETS family genes, we have desmoplastic small round cell sarcoma, we have decor rearranged sarcomas, and we have sick rearranged sarcomas. The sixth entity, as I already indicated, we are not going to consider we are only going to consider these five entities. So clues from clinical pictures. I'm not going to go into the details of this. We need to note age, sex, race, primary site, metastatic pattern. We'll get clues from details of each of these features. I'll just give you an example of age. 
if you are dealing with a soft tissue mass in a neonate, uh, you have to think in terms of a subset of BCOR sarcoma, which is given here. Of course, again, I, we are assuming that all other, all other small round cell tumors, established small round cell tumors have been, have been ruled out. And we are starting off with the assumption that we are dealing only with a case from EEFTs. So that's uh, the clue from the age. You can also get a clue from the race. It's a kind of negative or positive clue, whichever way you look at it. Ewing sarcoma is 10 times more common in whites. So if you have a case of EFT uh, from, a, uh, from a black uh, child or a black patient, uh, it's likely to be a non-ES. ES does occur in Eastern countries, I must point out. In this reference, it was, it was given that about 15% of bone cancers in India uh, are ES, Ewing sarcoma. So let me give you an example of clinical profile. White boy, 14 years old, metaphys metaphysial tumor in right femur, a moth-eaten appearance and no intratumoral bone formation. I must emphasize here that we must review the imaging studies with the radiologist before examining the slide. I'm sure this is a routine in all institutions. I just want to emphasize the importance of it. So the clue to working diagnosis on the basis of this clinical profile is that of ES, working diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma, which is the commonest EFT with this clinical profile. Now let's move on to histologic uh, clues. And histologic features are described in the literature on the basis mostly of resected specimens or incisional biopsies. And that is my personal experience too in most instances. The current trend is to give core biopsies. So some features which may be present only focally, for example, rosettes may not be seen or may be distorted in a core biopsy. But I would think that knowledge of all the features that have been described in the literature or seen in the personal experience would be helpful as a guide to what to look for in a core biopsy so that you can get maximum number of clues from your examination. So what are the histologic features that we look for in terms of clues for a working diagnosis? So these are tumor cells, sorry, these are tumor cells, their pattern, stroma, vascularity, and secondary changes. In each of these features, there are details, for example, atypia and other details. I will not go into this right now at this point. We are going to address these details when we discuss the histologic profiles of these tumors. Then second aspect is the pattern, whether diffuse or a specific pattern. Then Stroma, the amount of it particularly, whether it is minimal, moderate, or abundant. And then vascularity, whether the capillaries show any particular pattern. So these are the details of these <clears throat> uh, histologic, basic histologic features. Necrosis, microsis, and calcification should also be noted, but these do not provide any particular clues to the working diagnosis. So what I would suggest and probably many of you are already doing it, is to look for and make a note of details of each aspect of the features, that is tumor cells, their pattern, stroma, vascularity, and secondary changes. And on the basis of these notes, construct a histologic profile for a working diagnosis to be used for targeted ICC stains. So on the basis of uh, uh, this type of approach, the very first step in constructing the profile is to look at the tumor cells, whether, and I will come to that as we go on and to divide them into two major groups, Ewing sarcoma and non-Ewing sarcoma. So you have five tumors, you have divided into Ewing sarcoma and non-Ewing sarcoma. So you have these two groups on the basis of Basic cellular features, Ewing sarcoma, characterized by uniform, evenly spaced round cells without atypia. So in your biopsy, you this, you this feature, that gives you a clue to the working diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma. If you see in your biopsy 
unevenly spaced round cells and spindle cells and variable ATP that serves as a clue that you are probably dealing with a non-ES. So ES and non-ES are the two major groups of these EFTs and non-ES has four entities. So it has, I, I would like to divide them, divide this non-ES group into two subsets. This is for better understanding of this approach. So non-ES is divided into two subsets. The first subset is B core rearranged sarcomas. These are characterized by minimal ATP and four elements and classic pattern with chicken wire capillaries. And I'll come to these details as we go on to the histologic profiles. And the second subset is non B car rearranged sarcomas, which show moderate ATP. So it shows all the features that are that is um, unevenly spaced round cells and spindle cells, uh, stroma, uh, and another features, uh, cellular ATP, but the cellular ATP is moderate in this uh, subset, whereas it is minimal in this first subset of B car rearranged sarcoma. And in this second non B car rearranged sarcoma, we have these four entities, and I'll go in the, into the details of these four entities as we talk about histologic profiles of each of this entity. So, two groups, ES, non-ES. In non-ES, two subsets, B car rearranged and non-B car rearranged. So, that is the approach. So, if you have this kind of framework in your mind regarding these EFTs, it is helpful in coming to a working diagnosis. So let's talk about the first group, that is the ES, typical ES. That is the EFT with single cell type, uniform evenly spaced round cells, and generally low mitotic activity. These features are a clue to the working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma. The second broad group are the EFTs with generally with two cell types, that is round cells and spindle cells, which are unevenly spaced, have variable but generally moderate ATP of one or both cell types and generally moderate mitotic activity. So this is non-ES. So you can see the distinct differences between these two groups right here. And I will illustrate this to you as we go on. And so the two uh, groups on the basis of uh, these tumors uh, I have already indicated to you. Let's start with the first group, the single cell type, uniform, monotonous, evenly spaced round cells, absent or minimal ATP, fine chromatin, and absent or inconspicuous nucleoli, usually low mitotic activity and clear cytoplasm. So these are the details of the features which give you a clue that the tumor that you are dealing with probably uh, is uh, is like is probably or is likely to be an ES typical Ewing sarcoma. A more complete histologic profile will be constructed after finding more clues, and I will come to that as we go on. So this is a histologic picture of a tumor which shows round cells without cellular ATP. It's there's no coarse chromatin. There are no nucleoli except in a few cells, and there's a diffuse pattern. These are evenly spaced and there is a moderate mitotic activity here. And there are there is a suggestion of a partial lobular pattern. So as I already said, we try to generalize and there will always be, not always, but sometimes there will be exceptions to the generalizations. For example, instead of low mitosis, in this particular case, there is moderate mitosis and there is a suggestion of lobular pattern. So. Uh, let's now uh, uh, talk about the second group, that is the non-ES group. And the non-ES group is characterized by uneven spacing of round cells and spindle cells. There is stroma, there is variable cellular ATP characterized by hyperchromasia, presence of nucleoli and pleomorphism, and there is variable mitosis. When you have these features, these features are a clue that you, uh, your working diagnosis could be non-Ewing sarcoma although atypical Ewing sarcoma will also have some features uh, that are seen in this group, uh, that is the uh, atypia. I'll come to that as we go on. So these are the non-ES, examples of non-ES 
uh, EEFTs. What you are seeing here is round cells and spindle cells, uneven spacing of round cells, some uh, relatively less dense areas and somewhat more dense areas and presence of stroma. So this is non-ES in contrast to ES in which there are evenly spaced small round cells without cellular atypia. Here the cellular atypia at a low power is demonstrated by hyperchromasia. I will show the other uh, cellular features uh, like uh, uh, brisk mitosis and presence of nucleoli in this picture, as you can see here. This is another example of EEFT. So we have two broad groups of EEFTs, Ewing sarcoma and non-Ewing sarcoma. And in non-Ewing sarcoma, we have these four entities. So uh, I mentioned to you that in the two groups, the cellular, uh, based on cellular features, I referred to mitosis. And I might point out to you that in the second group of EEFTs, that is non-ES, there is usually moderate to brisk mitotic activity. And I've already shown you a photomicrograph of brisk mitotic activity. When you have a mitotic activity, which is relatively high, for example, 30 mitotic figures per 10 high power fields on an average, you have, you that is a clue for sick rearranged sarcoma. Yeah, and if you have extremely low mitotic activity, uh, in this non-ES group, non-ES group, you uh, that is a clue to EWS pads G1 fusion sarcoma. So again, here there is an exception to the generalization that non-EFTs show moderate to brisk mitosis. So always remember that we generalize, and then we also remember what are the possible exceptions. So the two groups, as I have indicated to you, that is ES and non-ES may not be as clearly defined in practice as I have described. There will be normal variations. I have already uh, referred to that. For example, uh, I give another example, and that is in sick rearranged sarcomas, there may be mostly round cells rather than an admixture of round cells and spindle cells. And in B-core rearranged sarcomas, there will always be minimal atypia. This is a normal variation. Uh, this is a normal feature of b core rearranged sarcoma. Or there will be exceptions. For example, in, you, in, in some rare cases of Ewing sarcoma, there may be predominantly or only spindle cells, and there may be moderate mitotic activity. And I have seen these type of rare examples in my own experience. So basically then you approach the biopsy uh, and look at the tumor cells and see whether they are evenly spaced or unevenly spaced, whether they are uniform or whether they are showing cellular atypia, whether there are only round cells or there is an admixture of round cells and spindle cells, and whether there is minimal stroma or no stroma or moderate amount of stroma. So on the basis of this type of distinction of cellular features, you can arrive at a clue whether it is an ES or a non-ES. And in most instances, this will work, this type of approach. Now, uh, this is an example of a non-ES characterized by unevenly spaced, there's some dense uh, cellularity here, there is relatively less dense cellularity here and here and here, and there is brisk cellular atypia. So cellular atypia, and there is also mixoid stroma. So, and this is a, another example of a non-ES, uh, which is supposed to show cellular atypia, but as I showed, as I mentioned to you, in uh, one of the non-ES, that is B-core rearranged sarcoma, the cellular atypia is confined to differences in contours of the cells, and no other features of cellular atypia like coarse chromatin or nucleoli or pleomorph or pleo distinct pleomorphism. Now, and there is low mitosis. So this is a non-ES lacking cellular atypia. So you have to remember all these variations as we approach, as you approach the uh, uh, working diagnosis of, of this tumors. And in some cases, and I, in rare cases, I wouldn't say rare, some cases, in rare cases, 
the uh, there may be a tumor which is composed almost uh, or predominantly of uh, uh, spindle cells and this is an example of a rare viewing sarcoma that i have seen in my practice so from this on, on from here on now we are going to talk we are i'm going to present to you the five histologic profiles but again to reiterate five eefts divided into two groups Ewing sarcoma and non-Ewing sarcoma, and and the non-Ewing sarcoma divided into two subsets: B-core rearranged sarcomas and non-B-core rearranged sarcoma. So keep that at the back of your mind when I am describing these five histologic profiles, which are constructed from literature and personal experience. And these first five histologic profiles provide clues for ES of different subtypes. And there are different subtypes in Ewing sarcoma. We'll, I'll come to that. And I will present to you one profile which serves as a clue for a non-ES, namely b core rearranged sarcoma. So let's uh, start with the uh, histologic profiles. The first histologic profile is that of a tumor consisting of uniform, evenly spaced round cells with low mitotic activity, fine chromatin, inconspicuous nuclei, light and dark cells, no rosettes, diffuse pattern with some areas showing lobular pattern, little stroma, and thin capillaries with no particular pattern. And some of the tumor cells have clear cytoplasm, uh, which is indicative of presence of glycogen and the reticulin stain shows no reticulin or sparse reticulin. So these clues from positive features, that is uniform, unevenly spaced cells, etc., and negative features, that is absence of ATP, absence of rosettes, and no reticulin around individual cells, and little or no stroma, these positive and negative features are clues for a working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma without neural differentiation. Let me, uh, I'm going to illustrate to you the cellular features that I've talked about in this uh, histologic profile. But before I do that, I just want to say that the cellular features that we are going to see are better seen in fine needle aspiration biopsy smears and, or in imprints of resected specimens and incisional biopsy. I will not advise making an imprint from a core biopsy. I, we don't want to produce any more distortion in the core biopsy that may already be present. So let's look at the cytologic features which provide a clue to the working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma without neural differentiation. These are cytologic smears. Uh, these pictures I have taken from an article published from one of the medical schools in my original hometown of Pune, India. You see here that they are uniform round cells with, with fine chromatin, no nucleoli. You can see that there are some darker cells interspersed between these light cells. So light cell and dark cells. Uh, this is a glycogen stain which shows positive staining for glycogen, PAS stain. And this is the histologic view of a tumor from the needle core biopsy. I, I have already shown you this, and I need not go into the details again. Uniform cells, evenly spaced, uh, diffuse pattern, little stroma. This is another picture of, from a core biopsy, not from core biopsy, from a resected specimen. It shows light and dark pattern. These are the light cells, uniform round cells, evenly spaced, no cellular ATP. I'm repeating this because this will make an imprint on your mind when you are approaching the differential diagnosis of this tumor and light and dark pattern. These dark cells are probably the result of degenerative changes in these light cells, uh, which are characteristically seen in Ewing sarcoma. You should look for that pattern. Then uh, this is another picture from uh, 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 a, a sarcoma, which is showing, again, small round cells, evenly spaced, uh, and some of the cells have light or clear cytoplasm, and it was positive for PAS stain. 
So glycogen is found in about 65% of Ewing sarcoma, but glycogen is also found in 50% of neuroblastoma and a small percentage of rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma and NHL. So uh, this stain is not of any particular use uh, uh, for histology, but let me jump to electron microscopy and point out that the glycogen that is seen ultrastructurally in Ewing sarcoma, it has a different pattern. It is in aggregate or rosette form in contrast to the individual particles in other small round cell tumors. As far as reticulin stain is concerned, I think it is an important stain uh, which shows you a negative finding in Ewing sarcoma, but a positive finding in a non-Ewing sarcoma. And I will come to that as we go on. And that is the highlighting of chicken wire capillary pattern on reticulin stain. We'll talk about that as we go on. Uh, with the profiles. So this is an electron micrograph of an Ewing sarcoma with glycogen showing the aggregate form. And this is a reticulin stain. I have taken this picture from second series of AFIP fascicles. It shows absence of reticulin around tumor cells. The reticulin is concentrated in the blood vessels. And this is a picture taken from another source which shows again the same type of pattern, small round cells, uniform spacing. And uh, oh, what we see here are capillaries, but there's capillaries do not form any particular pattern, unlike what we see in a non-ES, particularly b core rearranged sarcoma. So the profile that I presented to you so far, the first histologic profile, uh, uh, gives you a clue to the working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma without neural differentiation. In the next histologic profile, I'm going to say that you saw all the features in the first profile, but you saw rosettes. So this is a clue for typical Ewing sarcoma with neural differentiation. And rosettes are seen in about 24% cases of soft tissue Ewing sarcoma. So this is a Ewing sarcoma showing the rosettes and this uh, feature can, the rosettes can also be seen in a cell block prepared from a fine needle aspiration biopsy. And this was reported by these authors uh, in their uh, report of Ewing sarcoma diagnosed on fine needle aspiration biopsy. And note that they had documented the uh, ICC uh, markers and the genetic markers on their fine needle aspiration biopsy samples. Uh, electron microscopy can also show neural differentiation. And I have this is an electron micrograph of Ewing sarcoma showing again glycogen in the aggregate form, showing also neuro, neurotic processes with uh, neuroendocrine granules. So this profile we just go went over was uh, provided clues uh, regarding the working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma with neural differentiation. Let's move on to the next histologic profile, which is rare. Again, in this, all features in the first profile are seen with the addition of foci of basaloid cells and squamous cells. These features will provide a clue to the working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma with epithelial differentiation. So this is basaloid cells, this is squamous cells. And this is a Ewing sarcoma. These are all uh, small round cells evenly spaced. So, <clears throat> When we call this as Ewing sarcoma with basaloid pattern or squamous cells, of course, all other markers are demonstrated. Then the next profile, so the, the previous profile was a clue for typical Ewing sarcoma with epithelial differentiation. The next histologic profile is, is also rare, shows all features of first profile suggestive of typical Ewing sarcoma except that there is an adamantinoma-like pattern rather than a diffuse or lobular pattern. And rarely in these type of rare cases, rosettes may be present. So this type of histologic profile provides a clue to the working diagnosis of typical Ewing sarcoma with adamantinoma-like pattern. And this is the adamantinoma-like pattern, the peripheral palisading, and the you can see rosettes in this a rare instance of uh, Ewing sarcoma showing adamantinomous pattern. <clears throat> so now we are going to move on from typical Ewing sarcoma 
to atypical Ewing sarcoma, which is another subset of Ewing sarcoma. And this is also rare. In this histologic profile, you are seeing large evenly spaced atypical cells, not small evenly spaced uniform cells, but at a large evenly spaced atypical cells. There is coarse chromatin in these cells, there are prominent nucleoli, and there is prominent mitosis. So this histologic profile is different from typical ES in terms of the size of the cells and in terms of the presence of atypia. So these type of features give you a clue regarding the possible working diagnosis of large cell atypical during sarcoma. Of course, the differential diagnosis of large cell Ewing sarcoma is with non-ES, which will, uh, the even spacing, only round cells, little or no stroma will, pro will serve as clues for an atypical ES rather than a non-ES. So this is a rare example of atypical Ewing sarcoma that I have seen. These are large cells with cellular atypia, pleomorphism, coarse chromatin, nucleoli, moderate mitosis, and <clears throat> a diffuse pattern, evenly spaced round cells. So uh, little stroma. So this is an example of atypical Ewing sarcoma. You have to distinguish this from a non-ES because in non-ES also cellular ATP would be seen, but the features that are helpful to, are that there are no spindle cells and there is even spacing of these cells and there is no stroma. So I have talked, I've shown you five histologic profiles so far, and these histologic profiles uh, provide uh, clues to the working diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma, in which there are two major types, typical Ewing sarcoma and atypical large cell Ewing sarcoma. And I have shown you profiles of these. In the typical Ewing sarcoma, there are these subsets, typical Ewing sarcoma with or without neural differentiation, typical Ewing sarcoma with focal epithelial differentiation, and Ewing, uh, typical Ewing sarcoma with adamantinoma-like pattern. So there are these five different subtypes of Ewing sarcoma that you have to deal with when you are constructing a histologic profile. And I have shown you that if you construct the histologic profile and look at all the details, note all the details, you will be able to have clues to a working diagnosis of a subtype of Ewing sarcoma. Let's now move on from Ewing sarcoma to non-Ewing sarcoma. And in non-Ewing sarcoma, we have to deal with four different entities. And, uh, and in this, uh, the features that you see on a preliminary look at the biopsy, needle core biopsy are unlike the features that you see in group one, that is in Ewing sarcoma. These tumors are heterogeneous, but there are certain common features in this heterogeneous non-ES group. And that is uneven spacing of round cells and spindle cells. There is stroma, there is variable cellular atypia, varying cell contours or hyperchromasia, nucleola and pleomorphism. There is variable mitosis, usually moderate to brisk, although low mitosis may be also seen, and I'll point out to you as we go on. So these features will serve as clues to the possible working diagnosis of a non-ES. As I have already indicated to you, you have to rule out atypical Ewing sarcoma, and we have already talked about that. And then you construct a histologic profile. So in non-ES then, you have ES and you have four entities in non-ES. I would like to divide the non-ES into two subsets based on usual features. That is, two cell types and uneven spacing and trauma are common to these two subgroups, but there is a different degree of cellular atypia in these two subgroups. In the first subgroup, which, uh, in which there is B core rearranged sarcoma, there, are on, there is only minimal cellular atypia characterized by variable cell contours. There is fine chromatin, there are no nucleoli, and there is low mitotic rate. Whereas in the second subset of non-ES, which I like to call as non-B-core non rearranged sarcoma, there is moderate atypia with nucleoli, pleomorphism, and mitosis. 
So in this non B core, there are four different tumors or three different distinct entities with one in one with two subsets. And these are, so this is the two subgroups or two subsets of non-ES. B core rearranged sarcomas is the one group. And the second group are the FET non-ETS fusion sarcomas, desmoplastic small round cell sarcoma, and sick rearranged sarcoma. So you are dealing in with, you have uh, ruled out, uh, ruled out or in the, or you are getting, you are not getting clues for uh, possible working diagnosis of ES. So you are thinking of non-ES. So when you are thinking of non-ES, think of these two subsets, that is B-core rearranged and non-B-core rearranged. So the next histologic profile is that of a non-BS and particularly of the first subgroup that is the B-core rearranged sarcoma. What you are seeing in this histologic profile is round cell sarcomas arranged in cords and nests, spindle cells forming septa, variable contours as the only feature of cellular atypia, that is tumor cells have fine chromatin, no conspicuous nuclei, and there is no mitotic activity. And in addition to this, there is a feature which is highly characteristic, and that is chicken wire capillary pattern, and there is mixoid stroma. So these are the features in the histologic profile, and these features are also well described in the literature on or in a literature on all subsets of B core rearranged sarcoma. What I have what is primarily described was in the clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, which is one of the subsets of B core rearranged sarcoma. But literature review sh showed me that these features that is are noted here on this slide, and I have, I have already gone over, are seen in all subsets of B core rearranged sarcoma. That is established subset, that is clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, and recently described a B core rearranged sarcoma. So this profile was also described as I mentioned to you in CCSK. So on the so uh, I'm talking about B core as one of the subset of non ES. Now in B core itself there are three subsets. There are actually four subsets, but the fourth subset is uh, is outside the scope of this presentation. So I'm going to talk about only three subsets. That is B core fusion sarcoma with partners like CCNB3 and these types of uh, genes, soft tissue sarcomas V with B core internal tandem duplication of exon 16. This is referred to as primitive mixoid mesenchymal tumor of infancy or infantile undifferentiated round cell sarcoma with B core ITD. Some authors suggest that there is these two tumors, PMMTI and infantile undifferentiated sarcoma, are present a continuum or belong to a continuum. And the third subset in B core rearranged sarcomas is that of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, in major overwhelming majority of which you see B core ITD, although B core fusion with uh, CCNB3 is also seen in a small minority. So these are the three subsets of B core. So when we say non ES are divided into B core and non B core, in non in B core itself there are three uh, different subsets, and in non B core there are uh, three subsets. So it's getting complicated, but when you try to uh, divide the picture into these types of uh, uh, groups and subgroups, uh, the differential diagnosis becomes less challenging and less difficult. So the similarity between the recently described B core rearranged sarcomas and the well-established, well-characterized clear cell sarcomas of the kidney is well illustrated. This similarity is well illustrated and mentioned in recent articles on B core rearranged sarcomas, but not emphasized as a strong clue for working diagnosis on routine histologic examination. And these are the references on recently uh, described B core rearranged sarcomas. Now, in addition to the classic pattern that I described to you in terms of round cells arranged in cords surrounded by uh, septal cells forming fibro, forming, uh, forming septa, 
and the capillary is forming uh, a chicken wire type of pattern. This is the classical pattern. There are variant patterns also in all these subsets, in all these subsets. And these variant patterns are related to different features of cord cells or selective proliferation of cord cells or septal cells or excess or virtual absence of or focal hyalinization of the intercellular matrix or obscured or focally indiscernible capillary network due to cellularity or large amount of mixoid matrix. So in our generalization, there is a classic pattern and there will be variant patterns because of these differences in the features. So let me illustrate these patterns to you now. Classic pattern of CCSK, cord cells, round cells, no cellular atypia or very little cellular atypia by variation in the contours. <clears throat> they are arranged in nests as is shown here and there are septal cells which form the septa and there are capillaries hidden in this uh, vascular, uh, in this fibrous septa. So this is the four elements, round cells, spindle cells, mixoid pattern, and capillary network. And uh, the classical pattern, uh, arrangement in nests, surrounded by septa in which you see the chicken wire capillary network. Now in this particular h &E picture, that chicken wire capillary network, you have to assume that there are capillaries hidden in these, uh, in these septa. These can be brought out much better by doing a reticulin stain in which you can see the capillaries in the, uh, in the septa, fibrous septa. This is a kind of broken or uh, incomplete chicken wire pattern. But uh, again, these are generalizations. You, in very few cases, you will see the classical complete chicken wire uh, capillary pattern. But in this particular photomonograph, you are showing the chicken wire pattern in many different foci. And uh, you can uh, readily see that uh, uh, th th this, is a, uh, this is a clue for working diagnosis of b core rearranged sarcoma. If you want to see a well-developed uh, chicken wire network, you have to really look at a, a case of mixoid liposarcoma, which shows classical chicken wire pattern. This type of pattern also will be seen in uh, classical cases of B-core rearranged sarcoma, and I will show you one uh, from the literature. The variant patterns of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney are uh, shown here. This is, uh, the, uh, um, this is the variant pattern in which the, uh, the round cells are showing a selective proliferation, a dense packing. Uh, they still lack cellular atypia. The, vas the, the septa, the septal cells are forming incomplete septa and in which there are uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, capillaries which will form a chicken wire network. And this is another variant pattern in which you are seeing excess amount of uh, um, mixoid stroma and selective proliferation of septal cells. Uh, there is no nesting pattern here in this particular part of the tumor, only small round cells are seen. So these are varying patterns, but you are seeing the four elements, round cells, spindle cells, the septa, and in other, and some capillaries, the capillary network is missing here in this, but uh, you can always see this in other fields. This is another view of the uh, a varying pattern of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. Again, note that these are uh, cells which do not show the ATPI in terms of coarse chromatin or nucleoli, but show varying contours of the cells, and there is hyalinized, uh, uh, there is hyalinized uh, uh, stroma. Now, I will illustrate to you the classic and variant patterns of recently described subsets of B core rearranged sarcomas, including CCSK. So this is the classic pattern. This is the near classic pattern in which the fibrovas septa are incomplete. This is the varying pattern in which there is selective proliferation of septal cells and the arrangement of uh, uh, round cells is not seen in nesting pattern. There is excessive amount of mixoid stroma. This is another varying pattern. And this is also microcystic pattern showing because of um, excessive amount of mixoid stroma. 
and this is the presence of uh, 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 of uh, rosettes in this bee called rearrange sarcoma, which is an extremely rare finding. This is another type of uh, B core rearranged sarcoma, the B core internal tandem sarcoma, in which you are seeing the classical pattern. In this, the septa are incompletely developed. This is again um, uh, selective proliferation of round cells, the septal cells, the uh, the uh, the septal cells, the spindle cells are uh, uh, the septa are incomplete. This is again diffuse proliferation of round cells. So these are varying patterns in different, but then you look for the four elements, round cells, spindle cells, myxoid stomite, maybe in minimal amounts, and the chicken wire capillary network, which may not be completely developed. And this is another uh, photomagraph which shows the chicken wire pattern quite well in this particular picture. And then other atypical or, or varying variant patterns for example, selective proliferation of spindle cells, only areas of spindle cells, and so on. So these are the varying patterns. So the non-ES group has two subsets, b core rearranged sarcomas and non b core rearranged sarcomas, as I have already shown you. And in the non b core rearranged sarcomas, you have these subsets, uh, that is uh, the FET non-ETS fusion sarcoma, EWS, in which there is there are these two subsets, EWS NFAT C2 fusion sarcoma, EWS PAT C1 fusion sarcoma, desmoplastic small round cell sarcoma, uh, the sick rearranged sarcoma. So non-ES has these four different tumors. Uh, this, now I will not go over all the histologic profiles of these tumors. I'll just point out to you the clues, the main clues that you get to the diagnosis of non B core, non ES, that is non B core <coughs> uh, EFTs. So if you see myoepithelioma-like pattern in a and with focal staghorn blood vessels in a tumor which has features of a non ES a non-ES and non-BCOR think in terms of a working diagnosis of AWS and fat C2 fusion sarcoma. And this is an illustration of that. You are seeing myoepithelioma-like pattern. Note the cellular atypia, note the uneven spacing of the cells. So this is a non-ES group. This is a non-BCOR group because there is cellular atypia. And then uh, we go on to the Next one, and that is the uh, second group of uh, non-ES sarcomas, which show low mitotic rate, hyaluronide stroma, and hyaluronide capillaries, and that will uh, serve as a clue for working diagnosis of EWS PAD Z1 fusion sarcoma. And uh, this is an uh, illustration of that uneven spacing of small round cells. Uh, the, this is not high power view, but the uh, cellular ATPI is characterized by hyperchromasia. There are round cells and spindle cells. There is hyaline stroma and hyaluronide capillary. So this will serve as a clue for the diagnosis of EWS PAD Z1 fusion sarcoma. Let's now move on to desmoplastic small round cell sarcoma. And in this, you see desmoplasia as the uh, designation indicates. If you do electron microscopy on these tumors, you will see holes of intermediate filaments. So this these types of features will provide uh, a clue to the working diagnosis of desmoplastic small round cell sarcoma. A note must be made of the feature of, of a one particular exception, and that is no desmoplasia is seen in renal desmoplastic round cell sarcoma. So this is characteristic desmoplastic small round cell sarcoma. Uh, this is renal desmoplastic round cell sarcoma in which Desmoplasia is absent, but then you make this diagnosis on the basis of uh, ICC markers and genetic markers, and which we are going to come to in part two of my presentation. If you do electron microscopy on this uh, tumor, which uh, suggests the possibility of desmoplastic small round cell tumors, you will see holes of intermediate filaments, as is shown here. Then we move on to the last uh, subset in this non uh, ES non. B core group, and that is the sick rearranged sarcoma. Now, in this, uh, the uh, clues are provided by brisk mitosis, 
and focal rhabdoid shield. So if you are seeing a tumor which is non-ES, non-B core, and is showing brisk mitosis and focal rhabdoid change, uh, think in terms of C core, uh, sick rearrange, not C, sick rearrange uh, fusion sarcoma or rearrange sarcoma. Cellular atypia, brisk mitosis as is shown here, and rhabdoid chain as is shown here. So there are, I will just summarize now and uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I have already um, gone beyond that allotted time, but just a couple of slides. And that is you have, when you have a case from an EEFT, uh, which you have, and the assumption is that you have ruled out all other established small round cell tumors and you are dealing with these five entities in extended young family tumors, you have two basic groups on the basis of cellular features. Those, that group which shows uniform uneven, uh, sorry, uniform evenly spaced round cells without atypia, that is a clue for the possibility of Ewing sarcoma. You are seeing a tumor which consists of unevenly spaced round cells and spindle cells with variable atypia. You are, this is a clue for working diagnosis of non-ES and then non-ES is divided into two subsets. Non-ES is divided into two subsets. Minimal atypia is, uh, is a clue for working diagnosis of B-core rearranged sarcoma. All subsets of B core rearranged sarcoma. And uh, uh, the other subset, uh, you are seeing moderate atypia that is indicative of a non B core rearranged sarcoma in which you have these four entities which we have talked about. Uh, so you have approached the EFTs in this manner and you have now come to a working diagnosis in a given case. Now you are ready to request. ICC stains and construct an ICC profile uh, and which fits the working diagnosis based on clinical and histologic grounds. And then, so that is kind of confirmation of the working diagnosis. And then you go on to uh, request targeted tests for molecular genetic markers to make a definitive diagnosis if the ICC profile confirms the working diagnosis. And uh, this, these particular aspects of uh, diagnostic approach, I'm going to discuss in part two of my presentation. Thank you. And uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi, for this uh, illuminating talk on uh, giving family of tumors. And I hope the viewers have uh, learned a lot from your talk. I'm looking at questions online. Let me see what I find. Uh, so there is one question from a viewer uh, hmm. who says that uh, in countries which are not uh, rich in resources and immunostains, how do we diagnose like uh, the other Ewing related tumors like B core, et cetera? Well, I told you the histologic approach and um, for B core rearranged sarcomas, I can tell you from my experience that you can virtually make a diagnosis on histologic examination alone. But in this day and age, you have to go to the next steps. You have to find a resource, maybe in a regional center or a national center uh, in your country and get the ICC stains, which are characteristic for B core rearranged sarcomas. And then of course, and I will talk about these when I, in my second presentation. And then of course, the definitive diagnosis is based on demonstration of B core a fusion with CCNB3 or other genes or B core internal tandem duplication of exon 16. In this day and age, you can come up to a working diagnosis on the basis of histologic examination and suggest that to the clinicians uh, if you do not have other resources. Uh, 
but to make a definitive firm diagnosis, I must say you will have to send the case to a referral center. That's the way things are going in this day and age. Right. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. So here's another question from another viewer. The mm -hmm. question says that, uh, what is your experience on this uh, Ewing family related uh, tumor in uh, adults? Well, I am a pediatric pathologist. So I do not have uh, the experience of seeing these tumors in adults, except in one or two cases, which have been shared with me by my colleagues uh, in other countries. I will probably talk very briefly about one case in my second presentation. But I must tell you that all these tumors occur in children and in adults. Some tumors are more common in children. For example, Ewing sarcoma of the bone is more common in children, whereas Ewing sarcoma of the soft tissues is more common in adults than in children. Sick rearranged sarcomas are more common in, uh, in adults than in children. So uh, the uh, clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, which is a subset of B core rearranged sarcoma is almost exclusively in children, but other types of tumors uh, can occur in adults and uh, you have to deal with the tumors in adults exactly in the same manner that I have indicated in my, this first presentation that is, that deal, dealt with the constructing histologic profiles, clinical histologic profiles. Thank you, Dr. Josie. So uh, this is a question about clear cell sarcoma. So uh, the clear cell sarcoma, is it a, a pure morphologic diagnosis or which is a useful immunostain that, uh, that is useful to your experience, Dr. Joshi? Uh, is he asking about the stain? Yeah, immunostain, clear cell sarcoma. Oh, well, uh, the immunostain I'm coming to in my next presentation, but le let me say about histologic, purely on histologic grounds, the diagnosis of clear cell sarcoma. Firstly, let me point out to you that the term clear cell sarcoma of the kidney is a misnomer. The clarity or the clearness in the tumor, in the tumor is because of the presence of myxoid stroma and not because of clear cells. So that is number one. So, and, and histologically, as I've emphasized, you look for four basic elements, brown cells, spindle cells, myxoid stroma, and chicken wire capillary network. And these four elements will be present at least in some portions of the tumor. And you have to look for these carefully in all the different fields of the needle core biopsies that you will have. Of course, in a clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, a needle core biopsy is unlikely to be done because the approach to the diagnosis of renal tumors in children is not by way of needle core biopsy. Usually you get a resected specimen or if the tumor has already progressed and uh, is unresectable, then an open biopsy may be done. Although I have received in one case of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, needle core biopsies, and I can tell you on needle core biopsies, it can be very difficult to make a diagnosis of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. But if you remember that these are the four basic elements and you look for these four basic elements actively and remember that these four basic these two cellular types, round cells and septal cells, do not show cellular ATPA, unlike other EFTs. And also, they produce a classic pattern. The round cells are arranged in nests or, uh, or, or cores, which are surrounded by the septa formed by the spindle cells. And in the septa, you have the chicken wire um, capillary network. And between the round cells, you have the myxoid stroma. So this is the classic pattern. And if you might get varying patterns, which I've already illustrated to you, there may be selective proliferation of round cells. So in that, folk, in that area, in that field of the uh, clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, there may not be all the four elements present. There may be selective proliferation of the septal cells. There may be excessive amount of myxoid stroma. And all these features may obscure the 
chicken wire capillary network. But you have to actively look for these four elements and the classic pattern. Uh, and uh, in overwhelming majority of the tumors, I would say more than 90% of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, you will see at least in some foci the classic pattern. And then you will be able to make a relatively firm diagnosis of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. Thank you. Anything right. else? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Josie. There is one question from one of our viewers, Liliana Tomic. She has actually joined from Belgrade in Serbia. You would be happy to hear. So I see. Our question is, what is the difference in the outcome of treatment for the B-core tumor versus others? Well, which tumor versus others? B-core tumor. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to address the therapy in my presentations. But I, uh, I will address that very briefly in my second presentation because, after all, the reason, the practical reason for making a definitive diagnosis of an entity is to provide a guide to the clinician to use a specific protocol. Unfortunately, for B core rearranged sarcomas of the outside the kidney, I think there is no particular specific. Uh, 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 therapeutic protocol, all these tumors are treated on the same protocol as that for Ewing sarcoma. For Ewing sarcoma, the uh, response is uh, fairly good, but for non-Ewing sarcomas, the response is not as good as in Ewing sarcoma. That is the general statement I can make. As far as clear cell sarcoma of the kidneys is, is concerned, there is a specific protocol uh, used by the National MIMS Tumor Study or the Children's Oncology Group, and that is addition of doxorubicin and other chemotherapeutic agents. I'm not an expert on these, but there is a specific chemotherapy protocol uh, with or without radiation for clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, and that is more aggressive than the chemotherapy or than the therapeutic protocol for Wilms tumor. And with this aggressive uh, chemotherapy or therapeutic protocol, the results of survival have improved. I cannot give you the exact figures off the top of my head, but I can tell you that clear cell sarcoma of the kidney requires a different aggressive <clears throat> protocol uh, as compared with Wim's tumor. As for B core rearranged sarcomas of soft tissues, as far as I know, the same therapeutic protocol is used as for Ewing sarcoma. Although I can also probably say that targeted chemotherapeutic protocols to target the fusion proteins of these fusion uh, genes are probably in the works. And probably in the next few to several years, there the clinicians, the medical oncologists, the pediatric oncologists will probably develop these specific targeted chemotherapeutic protocols. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Josie. I think these are the questions that I found online. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and no more questions. And to the viewers, if you have any more questions, you can uh, write to us directly or you can post on Facebook as well. So Dr. we can pass on to Dr. Joshi. And again, like uh, Dr. Joshi will be back for his second part of this talk that is on February 15th, as Dr. Joshi mentioned, at uh, 9 uh, a.m. Pacific time and 12 p.m. Eastern time. So hope to see you then again. And uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for this excellent talk on uh, how to diagnose extended Ewing family tumors. And uh, Dr. Joshi, you would be happy to know that uh, uh, several hundred viewers joined online and uh, they joined from so many different countries. And mm -hmm. at least I could keep track of viewers from these few countries, like uh, they joined from uh, countries as far as Cambodia, Malaysia, uh, Macedonia, Egypt, Tunisia, Peru, South Africa, Mexico, Serbia, Bangladesh, Zambia, Algeria, India, Bolivia, United Kingdom, among others. And thanks to all our viewers for your support to Patcast. And if you like our lectures, so don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast, and also follow the Facebook page with the same name so that you can 
stay updated. We also have a website where all the lectures are organized subject wise. You can go there. And in fact, this lecture will also be available at IPNA website that is uh, www.ipna.org where also where you can get this lecture available. And uh, uh, Dr. Joshi is planning to provide uh, a PowerPoint of this talk. So I will share with uh, you on the website when it is ready. And uh, we also have a newsletter. So you can subscribe to our newsletter. You can, you can get the link for the newsletter on our website that is pathologycast.com. So our next lecture is on neuropathology. So uh, we will go to the part two of, of neuropathology, WHO classification of CNS tumors. Dr. Fausto Rodriguez from UCLA. So he is provide, he is presenting this uh, update on 2021 WSO classification. And his next talk is on January 18th, again, same time, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And he would be talking on glioneuronal tumors. And in fact, we are uh, trying to get uh, CME credit for this talk. So hopefully that will work out. And for that, you should uh, log in to the uh, City of Hope website, CME. So, I mean, and I have shared the links on our web page or also like on the uh, podcast uh, Facebook page. So maybe you can register and get CME credits as well. And thank you again, Dr. Joseph, for this excellent talk. And thank you. I uh, hope to see you again on February 15th for the second part. Thanks. It is exciting, uh, Dr. Rifat, to know that uh, there are viewers from so many different countries, and uh, it almost sounds like a pandemic of COVID-19. That is that is true, Dr. Zosi, and actually because of during the pandemics, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, people from so many different countries, so they they had uh, a lot of uh, difficulty in yeah. access to you know like off-site resources so in that yeah. time like online resources have been very helpful and thanks to speakers like you who has been willing to uh, help our viewers and all of us thank you so much thank you rifat thank you dr joshi thank you bye bye shall i stop sharing mm -hmm. yes please thank you <clears throat>